Hi, everybody. Um, this is Eleanor Setton. I'm Canoes Managing Director, and we're very pleased to be able um, to welcome Dr. Baldoff here to talk about urban green and built infrastructure. Um, Dr. Baldoff has over 20 years of experience um, researching emissions, air quality impacts, and adverse health effects from exposures to air pollution emitted by transportation and industrial sources. His research focuses on the development of policies and practices to mitigate air pollution emissions and impacts at local, urban, and global scales. He is a, uh, his research has led to national emission standards and best practices to mitigate air pollution impacts using urban development, including built and green infrastructure. He has a joint affiliation with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development and the Office of Transportation and Air Quality. He also maintains an adjunct professor appointments at the School of Engineering at North Carolina State University and Texas A&M University. So please uh, join us in welcoming Dr. Baldoff and um, enjoy the webinar. Great. Well, thanks so much, Eleanor, for the uh, introduction and the uh, invitation to share some of the work we're doing down here at the EPA. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And this was just a, a brief overview of the presentation. Great. Um, so I'll give some background on near road health concerns. And uh, this has really driven a lot of the, the research that we're doing in this area. Sorry, no pun intended. But i uh, also talk about ways EPA is mitigating some of these near road air pollution concerns. I'll focus on vegetation and noise barriers. and. Uh, I know this is a, a diverse audience, so I'll go over some of the, the research, but I'll really try to emphasize the bigger trends and things that are representative of, of a lot of the, the different research in this area, not just the um, example studies that I'll show. Uh, then I'll go over some of the resources that we've developed, as well as some uh, current projects in this area. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, great. Uh, so again, on near-road health concerns, there's been thousands of studies that have indicated that living, working, even going to school near large highways and other transportation facilities increases the risk of adverse health effects. Uh, I've just shown attached an example that the Health Effects Institute did a large meta-analysis back in 2010, although it's important to note that there's really been uh, hundreds more studies that have done since that review. Uh, but some of the adverse effects that have been linked to uh, near-road air pollution exposures include the, the list you see there, asthma, cardiovascular effects, births, and developmental effects, uh, even premature mortality and, and cancer. And again, even since the, the review by HEI, uh, a number of other endpoints have even uh, been linked to near-road exposures, actually childhood leukemia in particular. Uh, cognitive development, even autism, has been uh, linked with near-road exposures. Uh, it is important to note, though, you know, the strengths of these associations can vary depending on the number of studies, the consistency of the results, uh, but it, it is just uh, uh, interesting how many different health endpoints, again, have been linked with uh, near-road exposures. So if we can go to the next slide. So in addition to this link with adverse health effects, uh, a number of studies have also shown that air pollution and population exposures to air pollution can be highly elevated in this uh, near road environment, uh, especially within the first two to 300 meters. Uh, so this graph below is just an example from uh, another meta-analysis that was actually done in 2010 on field measurements uh, by Corner et al. And essentially, you can see that there are many uh, pollutants, especially those that are emitted directly by uh, vehicle exhaust uh, that can be highly elevated. They can be sometimes double, even sometimes as much as an order of magnitude higher within those first 200 meters or so from the road. And these can include things like carbon monoxide, uh, very small ultrafine particles, and even like soot or, or black carbon. So we can go to the next slide. And again, it's important then to note that there's a large portion of really the world's uh, population that can be exposed to these elevated uh, air pollution concentrations. Uh, I do have just some, some statistics for the U.S., and this is based on our most recent uh, 2010 census. 
And it's estimated that over 50 million people live within 100 meters of what's considered a, a large uh, transportation source. Most of that are the large highways in the U.S., but it does also include things like airports and, and rail yards. But again, the, the vast majority are, are located near large highways. In addition, in the U.S., over 4 million school children attend classes within 150 meters of a major highway, in this case, just highways. Uh, so there are even more with some of these other transportation sources. Uh, but about 1 in 11 schools overall are located this close to a, a major road. And maybe even more importantly, 1 in 5 new schools are located at this uh, short distance uh, from the road. Again, uh, land costs tend to be lower closer to the road, so you do see a, a lot of this development near road. And that just did include here a couple pictures there at the bottom right, just to give some examples of just a couple. But again, obviously, there's many schools that are, are located this close to a road. So we can go to the next slide. So because of these health concerns, EPA has implemented a, a number of strategies to try to mitigate uh, these traffic emission exposures and health effects. Uh, obviously, we reduce vehicle emissions. We have our, our national standards for uh, light-duty, heavy-duty vehicles, as well as even off-road vehicles. Um, but also have programs trying to reduce vehicle activity, uh, encourage things like public transit, uh, even walk-bike options. Hasn't been done as much in the U.S., but there have been some cities that have tried congestion pricing. Obviously, that's been more popular in, in other countries, but it, it is something that's that's been tried. Um, also, uh, states have developed what they call exclusion zones. So the best example in the U.S. is California. Right now, they restrict new schools from being sited within about 150 meters of a major road. Um, but also there's urban and transportation planning uh, methods that can be used to reduce exposures. Uh, it can be things like the road location and configuration. Again, this is also walk bike options fits into this category, site design and layouts. Uh, but then this area that I'm going to focus on are, are these roadside barriers or, again, how this urban green and built infrastructure can be used to reduce exposures. So we can go to the next slide. So this research really started because uh, many in the public were asking this question. They really wanted to know what can be done now uh, when we're concerned about near road health effects. Again, they've seen all this literature showing these adverse health effects. Uh, obviously, a lot of traffic already on the road, and they want to understand what can be done now. And really, there are a few other short-term mitigation options available. Again, emission standards, they can take long to implement both to develop the technologies that are required but then also just for fleet turnover and other things like that to occur to have the newer vehicles on the road uh, for activity reduction types of programs again planning zoning often large investments are needed to implement things like again public transit or even some of the walking biking options can take take a, a lot of effort and actually, California has had uh, difficulty implementing their exclusion zone regulation for schools, especially in urban area, just because uh, there's not a lot of land uh, available for these schools. So they either can't find schools further from the road, or when they do, they're in green areas. Kids have to be bus long distances. So there's a lot of feasibility concerns with that as well. But you can see, again, I just show a few examples, again, from the U.S. on schools located near very busy roads, even to the left there. That's a school you can see between all those vehicles. So, again, we have a lot of schools, though, that are facing, you know, these increased exposures and are looking for ways to, to mitigate them. So we can go to the next slide. So in addition to the, um, the potential air quality benefit, you know, roadside barriers have other, other benefits as well. And so we do try to include that and consider that when we're, we're evaluating these for potential use and potential air quality benefits. Obviously, noise barriers reduce noise, but they can also have some aesthetic benefits. And roadside vegetation has a lot of other uh, you know, potential benefits, including stormwater runoff control, so reduced uh, flooding on the road, uh, carbon sequestration, heat island effects, 
uh, again, uh, just aesthetic improvement, even, you know, a lot of studies show property values increase with more green. And then there have been quite a few health studies that just show a general positive public health improvement, just being exposed to green or in green spaces or exposed to greenness. So, so all these things also, you know, contribute to the potential benefits uh, for urban planning that these roadside features can have. So we can go to the next slide. So again, I'll just uh, start giving a few examples of some uh, research that has been done. Again, I'm going to focus on studies that we've done at the EPA, but also point out that you know a lot of other research groups have done work in this area, and so I'm showing things that are consistent with what others have found as well. So we can go to the next slide. And so this is an example of a study that was done in North Carolina. Um, you can see that we collected uh, particulate matter concentrations along a road in a clearing area and behind a vegetation barrier. And you can see that in the picture to the top left. And then actually behind the vegetation, we collected uh, pollutant concentrations at differing heights as well, uh, which you can see in the bottom picture. So I'm just showing one example of some of the results in the, the graph at the, the top right. And essentially what you can see, this is a particle number concentration. So again, these are indicators of motor vehicle exhaust. These are those very small ultrafine particles that come from, from fuel combustion. And what we see is that the, the, the solid line to the top are the, the concentrations in the clearing, and then the dotted lines are the concentrations behind the vegetation at the differing heights. And in the morning when winds are calm and generally from the road, uh, you can see that the particle number concentrations were reduced downwind of the vegetation, sometimes by as much as 50% uh, or even more. Um, higher reductions occurred closer to the ground where the vegetation was a bit thicker, but we saw uh, even reductions at that higher level behind the vegetation. However, a little bit later in the morning, the winds started to pick up, the winds became more variable. We saw varying effects, sometimes even where the behind vegetation was a little bit higher than the clearing, although not always statistically significant in that case. Um, but you can also see that these were conditions when concentrations overall are much lower, more dilution, higher winds. Uh, so we see that the vegetation was having reductions during conditions where concentrations tended to be highest. So we can go to the next. There's also been some uh, wind tunnel uh, studies that have been conducted uh, with vegetation. Essentially, the vegetation is packed inside the wind tunnel and measurements are collected, again, generally with uh, the small ultrafine particles. Uh, and they're, they're collected both entering and exiting the tunnel to get an idea of how much of a reduction the vegetation uh, can contribute. Uh, so the results that you see at the, the left uh, show that you know, particles are reduced from the vegetation. Generally, smaller size particles have higher removal rates than particles that would start to reach around 100 nanometers in di diameter. Uh, that removal increases at lower wind velocities, so that's similar to what we saw in the North Carolina study that I had just shown. Um, and then also something that's not shown here, but uh, with that picture at the bottom, essentially the leaf shape, uh, branch shape and size, and also characteristics can affect removal. Uh, generally, the more complex the, the leaf surface, the rougher, if it's got wax coatings like some types of pine trees, that tends to increase uh, removal of these particles as well. So we can go to the next slide. This is a study two that we had done in uh, the San Francisco Bay area of California. And so you see the uh, site at the top left. So we have a long stretch of a roadside vegetation barrier, mostly bushes and some combination of bushes and trees. And we took measurements at the six uh, numbered sites that, that you see identified in the top there. And then if you look below, there's actually pictures from each of the sites. And we chose these sites because they had differing vegetation characteristics. And I'll just kind of walk through that really quick. 
But our site one is just the clearing site. So again, there's no vegetation, no obstructions to airflow. Actually, you can see in the picture one of the, the methods that we use actually to collect our measurements as well. We have vehicles um, equipped with air quality sensors. We either run them off of batteries or they're electric vehicles so we don't self-contaminate. Uh, and just as an aside, if anybody's interested in site, if you look at Google Earth, you can actually see our measurement equipment at this site. And that's actually a Google Earth picture right there. Um, but again, our stop one is the, the clearing site Then you see below stop two. So we have thick bushes about three meters high at, at stop two. Stop three, we have actually more gap, very highly porous. It's, it's as thick as you see in two in these other sites, but it's very porous. There's gaps. There's actually some dead trees, so there's spacing where air can flow through. Uh, stop four, again, is bushes, but now about four and a half meters high. Stop five are thick bushes on each side, but there's a gap of about uh, a meter in, in width, and that's actually another of our sampling vehicles you see in the stop five picture. And then stop six is uh, thick bushes for about, again, that four meters or so high, but then some trees that go up into nine, 10 meters behind it. So this combination of bushes and trees. And so some of the measurement results are, are shown to the right. And uh, what the graph shows our concentrations normalized to the clearing site. So we get an idea if we're seeing reductions from no vegetation or even increases. Uh, the, the data to the far left is actually on-road measurements with our electric vehicles. So you get an idea just what distance can reduce concentrations. Uh, but then you see, again, stop one, the clearing, everything's normalized to. Then we see stop two, three, four, five, and six, again, all related to the picture shown to the left. Um, so what we see is generally decreases, usually somewhere around 15, uh, anywhere really from 10, I guess, to 20% in general. Uh, for both gaseous and pollutant concentrations. Um, but what's interesting is we actually see an increase in concentrations at stop three, where we had, again, the, the high porosity, the gaps. And this is actually consistent with other studies as well, some even showing bigger increases than, than what we saw. But then you see, again, when you have the thick bushes, you have thick bushes and trees together. Um, we do see pretty high reductions, and especially for those really small ultrafine particles, sometimes greater again than 50% with the bush and tree combination. Uh, we didn't see an impact from that gap at stop five. We think, though, there weren't a lot of wind conditions where the winds came straight from the road, so it seemed like the vegetation on each side actually still uh, helped with pollutant reductions. Um, but uh, that's still something I think we need to explore a little bit more. But again, these results generally show how much uh, different vegetation characteristics can affect uh, air pollution concentrations downwind. So we can go to the next slide. In addition to looking at vegetation, we've also looked at solid uh, noise barrier effects. Uh, this is actually an example from some computational fluid dynamics uh, modeling that shows how solid barriers impact near road air quality. So the graph to the right shows uh, an evaluation where there's, again, no barriers and so no obstructions to airflow, six meter and 18 meter high barriers. And essentially we see the barriers do decrease downwind concentrations at all heights. Uh, but however, barriers can actually increase concentrations on the upwind side. So there is this potential that pollutants are trapped on the upwind sides, raise, raising uh, concentrations there. The higher the barrier, the greater the downwind uh, reduction, but also the greater the upwind increase. However, I did want to note here that we have done other field studies. I won't show them, but they do suggest that the, when you have a highway on the upwind side of the barrier, that all that activity and turbulence that the vehicles on the highways create actually reduce that increase. We really don't see an increase in front of barriers uh, on highways because of all that activity. But the concern can be is if you actually have winds blowing towards the road and there's upwind air pollution sources and say there's a barrier in somebody's backyard or in a, you know at the edge of a school and there's upwind air pollution sources then you know these barriers potentially could trap pollutants and actually cause increased concentrations just under those conditions so again if considering this for an urban planning application that's something to consider we can go to the next slide 
So this slide shows uh, some results of a tracer study that we had done with um, our Department of Energy, a national lab in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And for this study, tracer gases were released on along a line source. And for part of it, there's clearing. And for part of it, there was this uh, simulated barrier, which was just hay bales, uh, which I used to be embarrassed about. But our Federal Highway Department actually really liked this setup. And uh, actually, I guess, has done this temporarily in some locations. So it turned out to be a, a, a good setup. And the results showed decreased downwind concentrations under all meteorological conditions. Again, sometimes concentration reductions are 50% or more for, for these tracers. Uh, so again, showing that uh, under all, at least downwind conditions, uh, a barrier can affect uh, pollutant concentrations and actually uh, result in, in decreases. So we can go to the next slide. And this is a field study that we conducted in Phoenix, again, using mobile monitoring, similar to the, the methods that we used in our California vegetation study. So here we did mobile monitoring, again, along highway, two stretches of highways, um, both with and uh, without a, a noise barrier. And we also did, again, some on-road measurements. Uh, and so the, the graphs show different concentrations at different distances uh, from the barrier. So the far left is the on-road, and you can see in both graphs there really wasn't much difference, again, with the on-road, so not seeing that trapping of pollutants on the highway. But then you can see the concentration differences with and without the barrier. So the clear white bars are the, the clearing, and then the shaded are behind the barrier. And so again, we saw reductions, sometimes 50% or more, even, even we saw reductions out to 300 meters from the, the barrier in, in both sections. Now note, these are distributions, they do overlap, but that's because background varies too, but these are actually, they're all statistically significant uh, differences when, when considering uh, mean variability and, and background being included. So, so again, we saw some significant reductions. So we can go to the next slide. So the last thing I, I did want to show is some research that, that we've done now looking at combinations of the solid and vegetation barriers. Uh, this is from a study also we did in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And you can see in the picture on the top left, a uh, uh, stretch of highway. We had measurements in a clearing, had measurements in that middle transect that are just behind a solid noise barrier. And then that far left transect, we had measurements that were behind a solid barrier and vegetation. Um, so if you go to the, the graph on the bottom right, you can see the general results uh, with concentration changes with distance from the road. Again, this is focusing on the small ultrafine particles as indicators of vehicle exhaust, but we see similar results for other pollutants. Um, so the, really, the, on the graph, the top clear data points, you know, that's the clearing, so there's no obstructions. The next group, the solid data points, are just behind the solid barrier. So again, we do see reductions, generally, what, the 15 20% range. But then you see much bigger reductions once we add vegetation with the solid barrier. And again, sometimes the reductions can be close to 50% or even more. Um, with this combination of, of vegetation and solid barrier. And I do want to just point out, I don't have their results, but a group in California just recently did a similar study and did see uh, similar results suggesting, again, this combination could have the greatest impact on downwind pollutant reductions. So we can go to the next slide. So based on this uh, research, as well, again, as uh, research by others, um, EPA recently developed some recommendations for planting and maintaining roadside vegetation for air quality benefits. Uh, primarily, this was developed uh, for some planting projects that we have in Detroit and Oakland, and I'll actually show some pictures and describe that a little bit later. Uh, but I did just want to point out this resource being available. It includes uh, using vegetation alone as well as combined with solid barriers. Uh, 
And um, I do have a few slides. I'll just kind of summarize kind of some of the take home messages from, from this report. So we can go to the next slide. So the report highlights some of the characteristics that are needed to reduce pollutant concentrations. Uh, things like complete coverage from the, the ground to the top of the canopy is really important. Uh, we do have need thickness that, that's adequate enough uh, to reduce porosity, so uh, porosity on the lower end. Usually we, we try to recommend at least 50%, if not greater, but even like around 80, 90% is, is, is even more ideal. I also try to avoid gaps in dead trees and spacing like I showed from that uh, California example. Um, the report also talks about types of trees and bushes, uh, things like you know using pine, coniferous types of trees, bushes that don't have seasonal effects, Again, looking for some of the, the characteristics of the, the leaves and branches being complex, rough, waxy, uh, things like that, um, as mentioned in the uh, wind tunnel results. And then also other aspects like mixing species, uh, mixing bushes, mixing trees, uh, kind of increasing coverage, but also you know adding to the robustness in case we do have any kind of you know, illness or other kinds of issues with a one species where we're not totally destroying the whole barrier. We can go to the next slide. In addition to the, the characteristics that are important to have uh, pollutant reductions, we also really want to highlight, you know, that there are conditions and characteristics, again, that can actually deteriorate local air quality or have, a, at a minimum, no effect but also, again, some studies have shown they can actually deteriorate, increase air pollution concentrations in that near road environment. Um, so things, again, like uh, the plumes being able to meander around edges, um, go through these gaps, go through high porosity areas, so we really don't want spaces between or under the trees. Uh, the picture in the top left, a lot of times when we talk about roadside vegetation, this is what people have in mind because they are very nice, ornamental, um, they provide shade and, and are inviting, but unfortunately, from an air quality perspective, they really don't do any good. And again, some studies suggest that they can actually increase concentrations because they essentially slow the wind down and they can uh, cause a stagnation effect. So pollutants can actually build up under and just behind the canopy, causing actually increased uh, concentrations as opposed to if the trees weren't even there at all. So we can go to the next slide. We're also developing some similar recommendations for solid noise barriers. Uh, some are, are similar to, to vegetation, but obviously there, there's some that are different. Again, as I had mentioned, research shows that the noise barriers can reduce downwind concentrations. Again, the higher the barrier, usually the higher the downwind uh, reduction. Um, it is important to note most of the studies have looked at barriers about four meters or higher, so that's generally what we would recommend. But again, the higher is uh, usually more of a downwind reduction. Uh, but we also have issues that, that need to be looked at if looking to apply this. Again, that pollutants can meander around edges. So if we do have a sensitive area, we'd want that, you know, the barrier edge to be at least 50 meters by beyond where that sensitive area is. So if it's like a school, we'd want the um, noise barrier to go at least 50 meters beyond the school so the pollutants don't just wrap around the edges, uh, but also things at the barrier top. So there's a picture in the middle on the left there. Um, you know, we don't want people to have access right at the top of the barrier because that is where concentrations will be higher. Um, you know, no balconies, no air intakes and things like that. So trying to, to point those kind of situations out. And then even looking again, considerations like upwind sources where again, the batter, barrier can trap uh, pollutants as they're traveling, you know, uh, from those upwind locations down. Uh, we would just want to make sure that we're not uh, exacerbating any existing problems. And then lastly, as shown in the bottom, that we 
have done this research with barriers generally close to the road and some modeling does suggest that that is better for reductions because you do have all this initial turbulence so generally we suggest the barrier be within about five meters of the nearest travel lane but uh, acknowledging that there's probably more research that needs to be done on that actual component. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, and then last, I did just want to uh, point out again, as I'd mentioned, that uh, a lot of the research does show the combination of solid noise and vegetation barriers actually have the greatest impacts um, so again, they increase pollutant dispersion, but you know the solid barrier again alone only increases dispersion. We don't have actual reductions where again there's a lot of evidence, especially for particulate matter, that the vegetation can actually remove uh, particles as well. So so again, when when looking at a situation, this is uh, potentially has the the greatest uh, benefit. This combination of the two. So we can go to the next slide. And last, in our uh, recommendations report that I mentioned, we do talk about some other characteristics, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on these as well. Uh, but looking at species, native, non-native, uh, appropriateness for the site, um, whether there's drought or flood uh, conditions that have to be uh, thought of. Again, in northern climates, obviously the resistance to uh, road treatment like salt and sand can be uh, very important in order to maintain the integrity of any type of vegetation barrier. And then also, as I've mentioned, some of the physical characteristics, not just height, thickness, length, but uh, this seasonal effects make sure that, you know, we're not going to have uh, a different type of barrier in the winter versus the summer. And again, the waxy leaf branch uh, types of conditions. And then even to uh, making sure that the, the trees themselves aren't emitting either pollution like volatile organic compounds, pollens, or even things like, you know, if we're looking at using these at a school, we'll make sure that there's not, you know, like a toxic flower or something associated with the bush. Um, so those types of considerations are, are included in the report. So we can go to the next slide. So now briefly, I'm just going to go through a few other uh, resources that we have in addition to that vegetation uh, planting guidance. So we can go to the next slide. So one is the U.S. Forest Service has what they call the iTree model, and this is something we actually reference in our recommendations report as well, since obviously uh, species types and recommended, you know, native versus non-native, that can all vary depending on region. So we try not to go into much detail in our uh, roadside barrier report on this, but instead what are the characteristics that are important and then point folks to the iTree model to try to understand what may be the best species. But again, things to consider in addition to the complexity of leaf surfaces, but you know, are they, known to remove pollutants. So like iTree doesn't necessarily get into the, the leaf types, but they have done some work and um, brought together a lot of research on tree and bush species that do tend to remove different types of pollutants. So that can be uh, looked at in the iTree model. Again, as I mentioned, not wanting trees or, or bushes that emit pollutants. And so that information is, is also available in iTree. So it can be a really good uh, resource uh, to try to at least help initially identify some species that might be useful for uh, a roadside barrier. So we can go to the next slide. Another resource uh, that might be of interest, again, as I mentioned early on in some of the justifications for this work, uh, a lot of it are the large number of schools that are located near roads. Um, so we did develop uh, a best practices guide a couple of years ago. It does include the use of, of roadside barriers and how best to implement them. But it also goes into other, you know, obviously indoor air quality is a big issue with schools. So what are filtration uh, devices, scenarios uh, that can be used to improve uh, and actually reduce children's exposures to ambient pollutant concentrations and then site related things, transportation policies, anti-idling of buses, anti-idling of personal vehicles, improving bus fleets and things like that. So, so again, this is some further information and this actually contains some of the statistics that I had mentioned earlier too in, in my introduction. 
So we can go to the next slide. We also have uh, what we call a near road question and answers web page that our Office of Transportation and Air Quality maintains. So again, there's a lot of useful information, uh, background information on emissions, air quality impacts, health effects. Uh, it is in the form of frequently asked questions though. So, and it does deal with, um, you know, mitigation options, somewhat similar to, to the other, uh, the near road school brochure that are, uh, best practices that I had mentioned. Um, so again, it does go into mitigation, but also mitigation for residential locations. Again, these solid and um, vegetation barriers are also addressed in, in this uh, website. So we can go to the next page. I did also want to mention uh, guidance that we're actually developing now, um, and those are recommendations for, you know, near road development, so for planners, community people, and this really is getting into, like, you know, corridor management, building design, so actually some indoor air quality aspects to that, but then as I'm trying to point out in this slide, some issues around, like, site design and layout, and so this uh, figure at the bottom is just an example. Uh, we actually Unfortunately, to the left, this was based off of an existing situation, a school right near the road, but then you see some other types of land use, and, you know, that was part of uh, actually overall development. And uh, so, again, giving suggestions, you know, how we can improve that layout, reduce people's exposures. Uh, so, again, moving the school furthest from the road as possible, including the barriers, um, you know, parking close to the road, but not, you know, apartments where in schools where people are going to spend significant amount of times. So I don't really have a time frame for this actually being released, but just, uh, you know, just to let you know, folks know that this is under development. And if there are questions, I can, you know, try to answer those as best as possible based on what exists right now. So that we can go to the next slide. And I also did want to point out there have been a number of uh, review articles on uh, vegetation and air quality in general. Um, so there's the, the Jan Hall paper, which really addresses more about how vegetation affects particulate matter concentrations. It does talk a bit about some of the roadside vegetation work, but it's also from an urban uh, perspective as well. Uh, the Gallagher paper is more about how uh, there's passive methods of pollution control that urban areas can implement. So again, it includes solid and vegetative barriers, but it also goes into building layout, street canyon design, even to the point of they've uh, some studies that have looked at how park car configurations can affect uh, near road air quality, especially in very dense urban areas. Um, the next one is a review, actually, that I put together, and um, just for full disclosure, it's actually very similar to our EPA planting report. Uh, we had had requests uh, for that to be in the peer review literature, especially for international organizations that were interested in the information, so we did turn that into a, a peer-reviewed uh, article. And then the uh, last summary by Abjit is uh, actually includes uh, some of the same information actually as our uh, report looking at open roads situations but also how vegetation can be used in street canyon scenarios and one thing that's nice is a lot of the similar characteristics that apply to open road also are applicable in a street canyon situation and this was actually developed for a, a large uh, project that that's underway in the in the European Union, and I'll mention that briefly here in a little bit. So we can go to the next slide. So last, I just want to mention some current uh, projects that are going on. So we can go to the next slide. So the EPA, as I mentioned, we have two projects, one in Detroit, uh, Michigan, and one in Oakland, California, where uh, roadside vegetation is being planted for an air quality benefit. Uh, we're collecting air quality meteorological, and in Detroit, at least, we're collecting noise data as well before and after planting. So the picture on the bottom left uh, just shows this is going to be in Detroit in a, a park. It's located right next to a heavily traveled road. You can actually see the small picture on the, the right 
see how close uh, trucks on the highway are getting. And this highway supports well over 200,000 vehicles a day. And I'm actually taking this picture from uh, one of the baseball fields in the park. So you can just see how close and really uninviting the park is. There's also a refinery across. So that's some of the buildings that you see on the picture to the left in the distance between uh, the refineries on the other side of the highway. Um, so there's a draft plan in the works and you can see that uh, on this slide in the bottom right. Um, so again, they're mixing bushes with trees and the trees mostly are like coniferous where they won't have seasonal effects, but there are some shade trees as well to make the park more inviting. Uh, but again, mixing this vegetation uh, to add in coverage, add robustness. Uh, the hope is too, the bushes will provide full coverage right at planting. So, uh, but we do also anticipate that the vegetative barrier will improve as the vegetation, especially the green, the trees uh, continue to grow. So you go to the next slide. In Oakland, it's a school located near a heavily traveled road. Uh, again, you can see the picture, the existing schoolyard on the, the left, again, just asphalt playground, not very inviting. You can see the large amount of traffic on the road. Again, this highway, well over 200,000 vehicles a day, and I think it's about 15 to 20% trucks. Uh, so a lot of emissions occurring. Um, again, we did some measurements before. Uh, those are shown in the bottom pictures. You can see we incorporated some educational materials for the kids, let them use some sensors, some low cost portable sensors to do some monitoring. We also did mobile monitoring. I won't get into it, but some of you might be familiar that the Google Street View cars are actually doing some air quality monitoring, and they were part of this uh, study as well, um, as well as some of our mobile monitoring. Um, the pictures to the right show, actually last year, they had a, a, a big planting event to kick this off. You can see some of the scenes from the kickoff, uh, hundreds of people there. You can actually see the picture at the bottom, get an idea of how the vegetation barrier is being planned. Um, and what's not shown here is uh, some large, actually, bamboo that go above the, the barrier wall height uh, to create that added uh, vegetation aspect. Unfortunately, uh, California had been in a drought right up until this planting, but literally a week after the planting occurred, they started having record floods. So we actually lost about half the trees and everything else had to be pulled. So it's only been slowly replanting. So we haven't had a chance yet to do the after planting assessment, even though uh, the, the, the planting had started about a year ago. But we're hopeful that everything will be in place by uh, this fall. And actually, I forgot to mention in Detroit, that's the, the plans as well, that they're going to start planting actually this spring, and we're going to do our post-planting assessment in the fall. So we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to mention briefly, too, there are some other uh, work going on internationally. Uh, the left is the grant I had mentioned from the European Union. So there's about six cities as part of this multi-million dollar. It's a Horizon 2020 grant for those who are familiar with that program. And so in some of these case studies, they're going to be planting uh, roadside vegetation, actually using our guidance. Um, we're actually not directly involved, but we've gotten some inquiries about there's a project in Mexico City, Via Verde, that you can see at the top there where they're trying to uh, put vegetation around columns and uh, influence airflow through for um, some particulate or some pollutant removal. We have talked with some folks, I'm not sure if it's going to be implemented or not, but actually filling in with vegetation in between too to create more barriers like the ones that, that I had shown and maybe have some additional reductions. And then also in the bottom, Singapore has actually been doing a lot of greening. And so we've had some inquiries there uh, too. So they might be doing some more roadside vegetation along the lines of, of what I've shown. So we can go to the next slide. With that, I'm going to finish up. I just wanted to acknowledge all the different people and groups that have been involved. In some of the research that I've shown, a lot of the research, though, that I didn't show, but that went into uh, some of the summaries and, and resources that, that, that I had shared. And so we can go to the next slide. It's really just the, the concluding aspect, just that it's important to understand how urban infrastructure does affect human exposure, especially near large air pollution sources like roads that can affect human health. Um, also, we want to understand how this 
infrastructure can be used, you know, when and how it can be used to mitigate these adverse health effects. Uh, again, as I've mentioned, the roadside vegetation noise barriers have been shown that under the correct characteristics and, and designs, they can actually have a, an air quality uh, benefit. Um, but I think it's just as important and part of our communication is we're trying to also highlight though that there are certain characteristics and conditions that can actually exacerbate air pollution problems. And so we really want, uh, especially urban planners, community folks to understand that and to try to avoid or mitigate even those situations if applicable. So, and so again, lastly, as I mentioned at EPA, we have developed some resources, which again, we hope are uh, you know useful as, as folks consider this as one of uh, a number of mitigation strategies for near road health concerns. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions that might have come up. Uh, hi, Rich. This is Jeff Brook here, Scientific Director for CANOE. Um, this has been a, a really fantastic presentation with just highly informative, a lot of information. And, you know, really from you know, day one, CANOE is not quite two years old yet, but from day one, you know, I just thought, you know, sooner rather than later we would really want to hear from you on your experiences and uh, and and so it's really great that you've been able to join us today and, and provide all this information. It's also even great that I note that uh, you've Canadianized a little bit and you talked about highways, not freeways. So <laughs> that's uh, always great to hear. Um, I suspect there'll be lots of questions and uh, of course, this will be posted on the CANOE website so people can look at it again and, and go over the details better or access the reports you referred to, which would be very, very useful also. Uh, but uh, we will have some time for questions at, th at this point in time, and, you know, and maybe I'll sort of ask a first question, um, which is about um, sort of the, the uh, attempts to perhaps document health benefits. So it's certainly clear that there's ways to reduce the exposures, uh, as you've exemplified. And um, we know that reducing exposures are, are clearly most often going to be beneficial. Um, but, uh, you know, when we think about you know, urban planning and think about, um, you know, the research that's going on, looking at the, also the health benefits of, you know, green spaces and green vegetation. And, you know, one area that's always thought about is, is that, the vegetation does buffer air pollution if it's the right spot. Uh, and are you aware of any any attempts to look at whether you can demonstrate improvements in health before, after, or you know, in certain scenarios, certainly interactions of traffic air pollution and, and green space? Um, that'd be that'd be great to know. Certainly, an interest as we delve more and more into how do we look at uh, the relations between health and green space and traffic. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks for the comments. And uh, I guess one thing before I answer the question, too, I did want to point out, because I know we do have limited time, so if anybody has additional questions that we can't get to, please don't hesitate to email. And I've got my contact information uh, on the screen, so don't hesitate to email, and I'd be happy to follow up with you. Um, but yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And I do know of some activities going on. I am not at least aware of any uh, studies that have been completed and either showed positive or no effects yet, but I know there are some groups uh, that are looking into it. EPA, actually, we are looking into that. Uh, really, right now, from a feasibility standpoint, the group I mentioned with the um, EU uh, Horizon 2020 grant is also going to uh, attempt to do some of that uh, with their project. Um, one of the issues though, and, and it's one that I again try to highlight, is that um, we most of the, the survey tools like GIS, satellite data, other types of models like that, they don't have uh, the capabilities to, to, to see the vegetation characteristics in enough detail to really understand do we have a situation that is likely to improve uh, the air quality or again, a situation where air quality might be exacerbated. And so some of the initial attempts that's where, where there's been some struggle, you know, we've been trying to use like street view and other types of t techniques to really see and to, 
come up with categories for vegetation on its potential to to reduce but that right now has been the the biggest challenge uh, to actually doing a health study um, but I think you know there's things and still you know technology that could overcome that and I'm hopeful maybe in the next two or three years that that will will be there and be able to do some of that work and I guess one other aspect though is we also are trying to develop some uh, model algorithms that could be incorporated into dispersion models, like in the US, our AirMod model, or um, ADMS in Europe um, that can account for both the vegetation effects under these different characteristics, and that could be useful for an exposure assessment uh, if, again, that input data is available. So if, as, as that progresses, it might aid in some health studies being done as well. Oh, that, that's that's. To, to know where this is heading, it is certainly a challenging question, and there, you know, there's lots of interest in it. And so, yes, again, I really want to thank you. I know there'll be there is already questions coming in uh, online, and uh, Mary Speck will will help sort of adjudicate that. Uh, but you know, for myself, uh, if winter ever let let's go here in Ontario, where it continues to be cold, uh, I know I'm going to have to get out and plant uh, the bu a bush right away, at least the right kind of bush. So, thank you, Rich, and. Um, we can, uh, I guess, continue for a little while longer with some questions, uh, to hopefully till uh, 1 o'clock. Here's a question from Eleanor Sutton. Thanks for the excellent presentation. Much of the research has been around for quite some time. What kind of uptake is happening in the U.S.? How many cities have implemented this and how? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and again, there has been the, the research on the uh, regional air quality effects, but I would say that the, the roadside effects are uh, fairly new. Um, like when we first started publishing now, it's like it's been about um, 10 years, but again, they were very initial. And um, so usually for things to start being implemented, you know, we wanted a little bit more weight of evidence, more research, more research just beyond just one um, research group as well. Uh, so I think, though, that has matured. Now you see the, but the projects that I mentioned are really the main ones, at least that I'm aware of, where they are, you know, approaching this from an air quality perspective. So it's really just starting. Um, as, as far as, again, I'm aware, there might be activities going on that, that we aren't aware of, but, um, you know, this has been kind of a fairly new area and just really starting to ramp up. All right, and we have another question from Peel Public Health. Have you encountered problems with maintaining the clear zone? Um, yeah, that has been an issue that, that's come up if we are, you know, suggesting planting on highway right away. And actually the project in Detroit is, um, is going to be partly on the right of way. And so we are doing some other, you know, mitigation like guardrails and other things um, to offset that we will be planting within the clear zone. Uh, one thing that I, it's just at least been discussed, although, you know, we haven't um, proceeded with there being any type of policy yet, but I think something that some of the uh, state DOTs are interested in is, you know, if we look at, uh, certain types, especially bush vegetation, um, where it wouldn't, you know, create an immediate impact, but would actually ease any kind of like vehicle that would enter into the vegetation actually could slow it down and, and actually increase safety. And we're looking at whether there might be a way to try to incorporate that with uh, some right away plantings. Um, but again, that's just some preliminary discussions, but something uh, that we're we're looking at and considering. And I have a question from Greg Evans. The results from the vegetative barriers look really encouraging. I can imagine school boards and cities really picking up on this. Assuming that broader barriers are installed, are there downsides we should watch out for other than upwind effects? Might, for example, this distract from implementing more substantive, substantive interventions? Yeah, that's a, a great question, too. Um, I guess to start with the, the latter, uh, and as I did try to do in the presentation as well, we do suggest this as one of a number 
of uh, mitigation strategies. So like our best practices, again, we talk about a number of mitigation strategies, but then also EPA as an agency, you know, we, we don't really want to encourage just this. Uh, we want all those other strategies to also be, um, you know, at least considered and at least some incorporated. So we don't look at this as a standalone, but at the same time, as I was trying to emphasize, when we do have these, um, you know, really tough situations and already exposures are high, again, this is one of the few things that can be done immediately. Uh, so we do suggest that implementation, but then also start with some of the other programs that can also reduce emissions and reduce exposures. Um, so then on the first part of the question, you know, again, in addition to some of that, the upwind sources, then it's more uh, like I'd mentioned to edge effects so of making sure that the barrier itself is fully protecting because the pollutants can wrap around edges and, and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're not affecting exposures at the at the edges and that you do have complete you know, maintenance, the full canopy. Um, but then even to, um, you know, appropriateness for the site, the vegetation being appropriate. Um, again, I'd mentioned the toxicity of the vegetation needs to be considered. You know, in California, they plant a lot of oleanders along highways, which we, we've shown, and that's one of the, the, the bushes that, that we evaluated in our San Francisco study. Um, but those can be toxic, and so if you have little kids, you know, they might be exposed to that. So, you know, those are the kind of considerations, too, that need to be taken in place. And that leads into our next question. Would you know what sort of species they will be planting in Detroit? Ash trees have been devastated in our area. Yeah, um, and I don't have the, the complete list because they have still kind of gone back and forth, but... Yeah, that definitely was mentioned, and I don't believe uh, that they're being considered uh, because of that. But I don't know that they've completely finalized the list, partly because of, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's available for planting this spring, since it is a, obviously it's a pretty large project. And so, you know, there's they're right now um, reaching out to nurseries and, and other groups. So, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have that complete list right now. And someone from Ottawa Public Health is asking, does anyone know if the Ontario Ministry of Transportation has adopted any policies that incorporate this evidence? Uh, I'm not aware of anything. Um, although I, I might add, though, that, you know, to this point, again, um, you know, these are really kind of the first case studies, so there are no U.S. DOTs either. Um, again, we're working with both the Michigan uh, Department of Transportation. We're also working with Caltrans in California, so they're very aware and they're very interested, and they see a lot of other applications as well. So um, we'll likely be using these, you know, case studies as a means to potentially, um, you know, build this into future policy. But, yeah, right now I'm not aware of anybody that has incorporated it yet. We have time for one last question from Public Health Ontario. Will these impacts last long term? How sustainable are these measures? Yeah, what actually, again, we anticipate that, um, you know, the benefits will actually grow as the vegetation grows. Um, so, again, one thing in our guidance is we, we do try to talk about, you know, mixing especially bushes and trees so that when you're first planting that you're going to get benefits right away, you know, that you're not, if we're just dealing with trees, you know, they're going to be small, they're going to have gaps. Um, so we try to give some recommendations and, you know, that we've worked with through our, um, you know, colleagues at the U.S. Forest Service and, and actually some of the state DOTs have given us recommendations on how to do that. Um, but then, again, you know, the, the mixing those with the trees and the trees will grow, we actually would, again, anticipate that the benefits will, will grow with uh, the vegetation growing. The big, obviously, caveat or, or concern around that is that, you know, you, you can't just plant and then walk away. There has to be some type of a maintenance uh, program to go along with it to make sure that the vegetation maintains its integrity and, and robustness all the way through. But if that is possible, then we can anticipate that there could be some long-term benefits.
Well, thank you, Dr. Baldoff. Um, a reminder that this meeting is recorded and it will be posted on the CANOE website. Um, and then thank you again. And uh, this concludes the webinar for today. Okay, thank you again for the invitation.